Okay, thank you. So, um, hello everybody again. And today I'm gonna introduce you to our Wikidata lesson for library carpentry, which we are currently working on. And I'm gonna give you a quick overview about what is Wikidata and show you our aim of the lesson and also in which state we are currently in. So, what is Wikidata? It's an open knowledge base, which is human and machine, readable, edible, and usable. And the data in Wikidata is semantic, so it's built as a RDF triple. So every item has a property and a value. So relationships between information can be easily built. And also uh, really nice to have in Wikidata is a query service where we can query individual information and Wikidata will show it to you in graphical form, like a knowledge graph or a table. So you can say, for example, show me all the cats, and Wikidata will show it to you with nice pictures. So for librarians, maybe cats are less interesting, but much more scientific articles from a publisher from maybe a special year. And Wikidata will then compile it to you and show you in a nice form. So what is the aim of the lesson? Um, we see a high potential in Wikidata for librarians to use it and to make it their powerful tool. And also the other way around, their information skills is very powerful to Wikidata. But at the moment, just a few libraries or universities are actually using it for collecting the data in a structured way. So to open up Wikidata for librarians, we built our lesson. And the topics for the lesson are an introduction to Wikidata and how it's built up, and also how it is connected to other wiki projects. And um, to understand the structure of the data, the librarians will learn how to edit and create items and support it with good ref reference. And the more interesting part is how they can actually import many data at once by using tools of Wikidata like SourceMD, or quick statements. Um, there's also one episode only about the query service of Wikidata and how librarians can use it, especially to create graphs or tables automatically. And last but not least, we plan one topic for bots and maybe um, how to work with Wikidata in the command line to use Wikidata even more efficient. So, what now? Um, the lesson by now had its first test event where we could provide many feedback on the topic and we also got new ideas during our lesson sprint at CarpentryCon. But so there's still some improvement to do and I warmly invite you to join the conversation on new ideas for the topic and also we created some issues on GitHub during the lesson sprint and you can jump onto if you're interested in. So I hope I raised your interest for this and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rabia. Um, if there's any questions for about the Library Carpentry Wiki data lesson, please drop them in the chat. Rabia, there's at least one question. Um, okay. How do you find teaching Sparkle? <laughs> Um, or do you teach other first, querying techniques? Yeah. So at our first test event, um, Konrad did this part and the time was too short to really do it. But um, I also have to learn it, actually. <laughs> I did it a long time ago, but I think it's fun. It's nearly like SQL. Yeah, it might sense actually do this together with an uh, with the SQL lesson, but um, we really only very shortly could show the very basic rings. And I think this uh, is going in the direction of planning the time differently or, or basically plan more time for this part in general. Okay, any other questions for Conrad or Rubea? Um, Unati, you can go ahead and get set up, share your screen. Um, I will. Uh, uh, you should be able to see both uh, 
my command prompt and my code. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Whoop. Uh, yeah. Can I? The text on the code is still a little small. I don't know if that's something. Um, is this better? That's better. If you could increase it even one or two more clicks, that would probably be mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Okay. Looks good. Okay. Go okay. ahead whenever you're ready. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about how you can use programming to sort of uh, dilute uh, mathematics. And I'm going to take a example, which is known as uh, one of uh, a tough problem that I, I, I took a long time to understand was the Monty Hall problem. Um, so the Monty Hall problems um, uh, was that there are, uh, so basically the problem is that there are three doors and uh, behind one, there is a car and uh, behind the other two, there are goats. And you want the car, so, uh, but you choose one and then the, uh, the host who knows which, uh, which door has what, opens the door which, uh, which has a goat. And so the question is, should you switch? And uh, the answer, the answer is uh, yes, you should, because that would increase your probability of success by two thirds. And a lot of people say that they shouldn't switch because it doesn't make a difference. It's uh, a lot of people assume it's 50-50%. And I'm going to demonstrate from code how exactly that's why that is not true. So um, if you if you see how I've coded it up is that I've uh, I've got it I, I'm uh, gen I'm I have three doors here and then I'm generating the permutations and I'm selecting the permutation so I as a person do not know what what every uh, which uh, door has what and then um, I have chosen a door uh, here I'm taking a random choice but you can put your input in whatever uh, suits you then you can you pop the door that is that you don't want to open that particular door as a host right so that's that's how I coded that and then um, this is where this is the non dilute uh, this is where uh, the problem gets interesting so how do you open a door uh, behind which there are only goats and not cars and that 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 shows you why your probability will be two third. So out here you can see if the chosen item is not car, then I will uh, then I can uh, then I uh, then I can select which door to open because I'll have two goats behind them and I can choose any one of them. While if the door uh, if the if if I've if I've if I've chosen the car. Uh, sorry, if I've not chosen the card, then I don't have a choice but to open the uh, door which has the goat. While if I've chosen the card, um, that I have two choices as a host to open. And the probability that I will choose the card on the first try is one by third. And this, this if else loop is the reason why Monty Hall problem gives you two third of success if you switch. Um, and this is where you switch or not switch. And uh, if you switch, I've just, uh, uh, switch the items here. Okay, so I'm just going to demonstrate that. So in this particular problem, we're not switching. So uh, here's what I've chosen. And I'm going to uh, buy usually a lot of problems, you can demonstrate them, that using law of uh, uh, large, uh, uh, large numbers, which is that if you do it enough times, it will come to a probability that uh, that you expect. And out here, if I keep doing this, you will see. And if I compute all this, this will show you that there are two thirds of, if I do it enough times, I'll, it'll tend to two, two by th uh, one by three in this case, because I'm not switching. Um, and if I switch here, it would become uh, uh, two by three times that I'll be successful here. <laughs> so I lost, uh, one time on the four. So that was my uh, that was my demonstration on how easily you can use coding to understand difficult problems in maths just because uh, they're much easier. Um, so what do you? I would I would ask you to look up uh, Lewis Carroll's pillow problem on particularly there's one blue blue ball and red ball and try and code it yourself. And uh, I hope this can sort of serve as a uh, template for that. Yeah, that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Nadi. Um, that's I think that's a really creative idea using programming to better understand 
a complex problem in another domain, in this case, mathematics. Um, any, any quick questions for Unadi before we move on to our next speaker? All right, uh, Neil, I think you're up next. If you can get your screen share to work a second time. <laughs> Crashed. Oh no. Well, at least you can hear me still. That's the nice thing about two devices. Okay. You just have to not crash while I'm sharing. Okay. Looks good for now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Fantastic. All right. So this is data harvesting for agriculture. Uh, we've had a little bit of a transience in the name, data carpentry versus uh, other things for, for this name. Um, this is a project I've been working on with uh, several other people at the University of Illinois. One of our principal authors, Jill Naiman, is in the audience today. And our objective with, uh, with this workshop has been to address the recent rapid increase in data volume which farms are producing. All right, so we know that we have a lot of uh, instrumented equipment uh, coming from deer tractors and, and other things, uh, combine harvesters. Everything is producing data. Now, there's a, there's a related problem, which is the right to data ownership and the right to repair laws and, and uh, these sorts of movements that are also going on as well. Uh, what we've focused on more is just what do you do with data once you have the data? So we've structured a workshop which is intended to be able to help farmers and crop advisors be able to pull together small computer programs for analysis, visualization, and decision making. Uh, so our scope has been a non-academic audience and we haven't assumed any prior programming. This has placed pretty strong limits on what we've been able to do, of course, given a two-day workshop. Uh, the, the dilemma that we had to make a decision around was, do we teach a little bit of programming and just don't get very far and very effective with what you can do with, you know, for loops in R, or do we give them more prepackaged tools? And so what we ended up uh, uh, leaning more towards was composing some powerful R scripts that do certain things that encapsulate the behavior that we want to see and teaching them to how do you get your data in the right format so that these scripts just work with the things that you're putting into it. Um, we focused on the RR Studio pipeline, since that's a pretty friendly way to put things together. Things like the way that ggplot are very friendly to beginners and thinking about in, in terms of how do you compose uh, elements together. We also focused on some geospatial data with QGIS. Uh, we talked about trial design. That was kind of the uh, the main story problem, which uh, the narrative which took us all the way through the workshop. And then we also pulled in some ancillary data, such as weather history, soil types, other things that are available online. Um, for instance, right now we're working on uh, scoring away a finance data exercise that pulls in financial data from different places. Our products look like this, where we have a hypothetical field and we're able to pull in um, online data and help them map and visualize everything that's going on. Uh, some of this they would already know from uh, resources that they have, right? You can go uh, look online or you can get a book and this has all of your soil types and the characteristics of these uh, of these different soils, um, at least for all of the uh, the Midwest. We're also able to pull in the, the, you know, the nitrogen rate, the seeding rate. Uh, we're able to look at the yield per plot and put that together into a more coherent picture of what's going on. Uh, how do you do data cleaning? So, for instance, you'll notice that there's a few places on the left-hand side where they're uh, applying the nitrogen, where there are wobbles in the data because the uh, tractor wasn't driving straight for any of the, of the dozen possible reasons. And we talk about, you know, how do you clean those up? How do you pull those together into the uh, the blocks that correspond to them in the in the trial data? Um, so we ran two workshops uh, back in February, March of this year. I guess we were January, February. Uh, it seems like a long time ago. Uh, we had probably total about uh, 15 farmers participate in this. We had a grant, so we were able to do this for free uh, for them, and, and they were able to. Uh, we had some come from as far away as Kansas to get input on this. So it was described as a, a good intro to working with spatial data in R. 
but some of our feedback was that we need to do less emphasis on trials and focus more on how do we pull in our own data and do good work with, with good work on that with uh, geospatial and uh, pulling and mapping and climate data and everything, uh, which makes sense. The the uh, trials was more of a uh, an opportunity that came up because of um, some of our contributors were working on a similar project that really built on that. So we would like to continue to expand and refine these workshops and be able to offer them. These have been submitted to the Carpentries Incubator, so we may see these come together as a, as a full-fledged, uh, uh, at least a, at least an alpha project under the Carpentries umbrella. We're going to focus more on field operations, and we're going to, at some point we'd like to include irrigation-based farming since that's the other major kind of farming that that's uh, that's out there. Uh, you know, farther east you are, you don't need to worry about that. But as you get over into Iowa and Kansas, you have to worry a lot more about the the costs and uh, considerations of including irrigation. Neil, you are basically at okay. time, so if you could wrap up in the next 30 seconds. Okay. All right, so our credits, uh, Lindsay Clark with our PI. She's with HPC Bio here at the University of Illinois. Jill Naiman in the audience uh, has written a lot of our R scripts for us. Brittany Edge, Alan Gong, our graduate students here, and Dina Strong is with our uh, IT group on campus. She's done really great work in keeping this going and, and uh, making sure the water gets to the end of the row and running this project. So it's been a pleasure to work on this. And if you're interested, you can find us on GitHub at Data Carpentry for Agriculture slash trial lesson, or you can email us at dataharvesting at illinois.edu. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, if you could drop that contact info in the chat as well, that would be awesome. Um, Angela, do you have a specific question around geospatial? And while we're waiting, Emmy, you'll be up next. Angela, if you're, if you're interested, email us or, or ping me here and we'll be happy to, I, I'd like to get a, one of the topic box discussion lists going for this because we've had a lot of interest from people at University of Oklahoma and Iowa and some other places. Cool, thanks Neil. Um, all right, go ahead Emmy, start when you're ready. Sorry, this mute button always get me. Hi everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I want, I want to talk a bit about papers and publishing. Um, so I'm a bit nostalgic here because, uh, yeah, this was very similar to a slide that I used last year at uh, Manchester's uh, Carpentry Connect. Um, so um, some of you may be familiar, but it, it, I think it highlights nicely how, you know, while the web technologies have changed a lot of the ways that we consume content and information, um, for example, from how we find out about the news, if you think about it, to like navigating using maps. But unfortunately, those changes haven't really happened to the communication or consumption of scientific research content. So if you look at like a methods section from a paper from 100 years ago or 30, 30 years ago to today, um, it's not really keeping in keeping with the development of the complexity of scientific methods that we have nowadays. So as a researcher nowadays, you'll most likely be using a computer for some aspects of your work, at least um, handling and analyzing big data and writing code is becoming very, very common. Um, the PDF form of a paper just isn't built to allow those elements to be shared efficiently or effectively. So, at eLife, we've been sort of working on tap tackling this problem for, for a while now. And um, this is sort of what uh, we envision to be a, a future a type of manuscript where code and data can be embedded into the nar narrative. So you just saw me scroll past like a normal paper on, on, on our website. Um, but I've also just expanded a figure. And here you're seeing that the code that generated that figure. Um, I'm also, what I'm also doing here is that I'm actually amending that code live in the browser, re-executing it. Just hang on for a minute while I do that um, in ggplot and I was changing the plot. Um, so that was all very fast because this is a lightning talk, but uh, there's a demo that you can go and play around with as well because it's live on, on, on the internet now. So um, that's our vision. So we introduced this more than a year ago now, a year and a half ago now. Um, and we've been working very hard with our collaborator, uh, Stencilla, 
on um, building a workflow, so an open stack of tools that will allow um, authors to be able to enrich their published articles with code and data and publish a manuscript that is similar to the one that I've just shown you. So this is sort of what, what it looks like at the moment. Um, our, our sort of development principles here is that we don't want to we don't want researchers to have to learn a whole host of new tools in order to be able to do that. We want to make sure that our tools are interoperable with existing tools that authors are using, so R Markdown and Jupyter Notebook. Um, and we want to make sure that all the tools that we develop are open source, so the code base is actually on GitHub. Um, so the workflows should be really simple. You assume you've published with us, um, you should be able to use Stencilla's uh, tool to be able to convert that article from uh, the published form to an R Markdown on Jupyter, add your code chunks back in locally, um, and then upload that back into uh, Stencilla, and then share that with our production team, and we will get it published for you. So <laughs> I hope that sounds interesting and exciting. Um, I was hoping that we, we'd, we would have launched by this point, but uh, we're still sort of tidying up the last bits of work, but it should be coming out in the next two weeks or so, fingers crossed. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're very excited about this and we'd love to see, you know, what the community thinks about this after, you know, you've had a go at trying, playing around with the work that we will be publishing, that will be executable and uh, having a go at composing your own executable research article. Um, if you have any questions, put it in the chat box or my contact details are here. We are on Twitter, eLife Innovation, email address, and if you want latest updates on our projects and maybe you have comments or um, views on how this tool stack or this sort of publishing can look like in the future, uh, please sign up for our, our bi-monthly update. Here's the link on the screen as well. Um, and definitely email us and contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Emmy. Super interesting. Any questions for Emmy in the chat um, about this? Later. I think we're all so wowed. We don't have any questions yet. <laughs> That's <laughs> really cool. All right. Um, so I think next up is Hannah. Go ahead. Unmuting myself. An okay. important step. <laughs> That's a very important step. So uh, I'm going to just dive right in. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today presenting our lightning talk. You can see here identifying opportunities for inclusive language in Carpentries workshops with uh, some case studies at, at Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. And again, I'm presenting on behalf of myself and my coworkers here. You can see uh, our names and Twitter handles there. So why are we even having this conversation? This stems from some work on inclusive data education in, in libraries that CMU as well as some other institutions are beginning a collaboration on. And a general idea is that so many of our educational blueprints are actually rooted in this phrase, best practices, which exists for a reason, but uh, you know, for many reasons, members of this inclusive research data team have found this phrase to be exclusionary in some cases. And since we're really trying to expand our Carpentries capabilities at CMU, we thought we could use these workshops as a chance to use more inclusive language. And to clarify, these would, ref these would refer to workshops that we teach in-house since we're all certified instructors. So with best practices, the assumption can often be that researchers are operating in a very baseline socioeconomic level with access to certain institutional services, having certain cognitive and physical abilities. And the Carpentries already does a great job in instructor training to teach us to avoid using things like simple, easy, you know, words like that in our instruction. Because something that is simple to you may be incredibly, incredibly difficult for another person for a host of reasons. So we thought we could take this a step further and provide more ideas for inclusive language. In a note, we're approaching this from our own positionality in our CMU-based team of instructors and spe speaking to our own lived experiences with how we perceive best practices. And for the sake of a lightning talk, we're going to focus on just one of these things. So we're going to focus on inclusive language for neurodiverse researchers and uh, learners in these workshops. 
And neurodiversity is just an umbrella concept where neurological differences are recognized and respected just like any other human variation. And so with me speaking today, this presentation is based on my own positionality as a neurodivergent librarian whose neurodivergence manifests in part through severe anxiety. So that's the lens that I'm speaking from. So next slide. So we have just two very short examples here to start the conversation. By no means is an exhaustive list, but the first opportunity for inclusive language is in the data carpentries lesson, uh, data organization and spreadsheets for social scientists. So one opportunity here is just to remind learners that they might find themselves with very untidy data for a host of reasons. Some may be through no fault of their own. And it doesn't mean they're a bad researcher if they're in that situation. And just reiterating that can be really good, especially for a potentially neurodiverse, uh, neurodivergent person who's experiencing anxiety around these sort of things. So this uses the lesson as a way to empower those who might feel shame or anxiety around having untidy data. The second example here is the data carpentry's lesson called data carpentry uh, are for social scientists. And it's an opportunity for your inclusive language just to reiterate to learners that it can absolutely take time to learn these concepts. And as Carpentry's instructors, we are there for you throughout that journey, you know, using patience and compassion. You know, I've witnessed experiences before outside of the Carpentry's, I'm happy to say, where those who were instructing some programming concepts were actually getting, you know, like noticeably frustrated and short with researchers who were or learners who are feeling anxiety around learning these things. So that doesn't help anybody. That doesn't help the situation. So when we're highlighting this lesson, uh, this could really be said for any lesson is that these concepts can take time to learn. So again, I've only shared two examples today, and I know I'm coming up towards the end of my talk uh, just due to time constraints, but we do have we're working on many other ways to think about how we can change our language and reactions to be more inclusive and supportive of our learners in our workshop. So again, this is a work in progress, and it's really just getting the conversation started. We're super excited at CMU Libraries and our partner institutions. And if you would like to get involved in collaborating, please feel free to email me here. I will also throw that in chat. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I have a question. Do you all have a list or a resource where you're compiling some of these suggestions or ideas? Absolutely. So the eventual goal is to have a GitHub, like a GitHub page uh, toolkit. So a toolkit for inclusive, starting with data management, but eventually going to data, data education. So uh, COVID-19, that was supposed to be in the summer, COVID-19 has kind of slowed that down, but that's the eventual goal is just this free open resource that anybody could go to and use for any time they're in a situation where they're teaching about data. And then a follow-up question from Lex. Angela, go ahead and get your slides up um, while Hannah answer, answers this one. Yeah, so pull request to the, absolutely, this was actually one of the things I did to get instructor uh, to get certified was I found an opportunity where I said, you know, do we really need to be saying this here? This is kind of this is this doesn't seem super inclusive and it was accepted. And so yeah, that's absolutely in part of the the general plan and, and supporting just an inclusive community. <laughs> okay, thanks, Hannah. That's really interesting. All right, we can see your slides, take it away. Okay, um, I'm gonna be giving a short version of a talk I gave previously at CSV Comp about building data communities. So I'm um, excited to share this with everyone today. Um, so um, for another version of this talk, again, you can find this at bit.ly 2020-05-CSV Comp and there's like a 20 minute version of this talk. Um, I made this a little bit more about carpentries and a little bit uh, less about sort of the art community. Um, so recently I have built a lot of data communities. So um, on the left, you can see um, a workshop that I've done for our ladies. Um, on the right is a, a different um, full day um, package development workshop we've done for uh, women and, and minorities in Chicago. Um, for the Carpentries community, I've recently been in charge of putting together maintainer onboarding for the Carpentries. So there are a few people here who have gone through that. Um, we have a curriculum for maintainer onboarding, and I'll share the link later. Um, 
and we were able to onboard um, 23 new lesson maintainers in um, in the last few weeks. And so we are very, very excited about all of this. So I'm speaking from that experience. Um, feel free to take a look at this blog post later as well. Um, so I believe community building is a skill, just like anything else. So just like programming, um, it's something that we can practice, reflect on, and get better at. Um, the communities that I'm talking about, um, again, are the Carpentries, um, my research center, the Center for Spatial Data Science at the University of Chicago, and then the Our Ladies community. I thought a little bit about why they worked, you know, what, what things do they have in common that makes them work so well. Um, and I don't know if this is the definitive list of what makes them all similar or why these communities work, but I believe that em excitement, empathy, and kindness are key features of all three of these communities. Um, in terms of excitement, um, you know, um, thinking about what motivates the people in your community to do what they do. Um, Stereotypically, um, I have seen people get really excited by um, geospatial visualizations and maybe not so excited by, um, you know, data formats and structures. However, you have to know your community, right? So maybe it's exciting to, um, to be in a community with other people, but also maybe it's exciting to finally get R working on your computer. Um, maybe that is not not exciting, right? Like having a working version of something on your computer, that's, that's pretty exciting if you've never been able to do that before. Um, next, um, empathy. Um, so in terms of empathy, I mean, um, like thinking about what problems your um, learners are coming from. I think this is built into the carpentries. Um, I also have built a lot of empathy through teaching workshops. Um, so this is sort of um, something that I feel like not only do I improve as a teacher um, and not only um, do my learners learn skills, I become a more empathetic um, programmer and developer. So again, building empathy through troubleshooting together, um, helping out and, and seeing how people learn. Okay. Um, finally, um, kindness. I think this is a key part of any community. Um, and I think the Carpentries does this so, so well. Um, I, I, I think in terms of, if you haven't seen this book, Teaching Tech Together, um, it's great. It's by Greg Wilson. Um, but the first rule in that book is be kind, all else is details. And I think this is just such a fundamental piece of what makes um, our community work um, the way it does. Okay, um, on kindness, self-care and self-kindness, I wanted to do a reality check and say, if you're in a community and you've been giving a lot and a lot, you have the right to stop, take a break, or leave whenever you need to. Um, I've seen people, um, you know, get a little bit burnt out. And I feel like Bianca is going to be talking about this at the next Carpentry Con session. Um, but you have the privilege to bring others along so that they can, they can grow. So it's not you stepping back, it's you stepping to the side so someone else can come in and lead that community. Okay. Um, so I believe excitement, empathy, and kindness are definitely key features of a community. Um, and that all leads to belonging. So um, I hope that all of us feel like we belong in the Carpentries community, um, that we're valuable members, and um, that we're able to contribute. Finally, I want to conclude, keep building community, keep getting feedback, um, keep working on it. Um, you know your institution better than me. Um, so there are definitely things in here that I haven't touched on, but hopefully this, this gives you a few things to think about. And um, I wanted to shout out in my thank you that we're looking for the next maintainer community lead. So um, if you're curious about how I built the maintainer community this um, spring and summer, um, take a look at this blog post. It's called Building the Maintainer Community and Your Own Skill Set. Um, it talks a little bit about how I got my institution to um, support my work in the Carpentries. And you can stay in touch on the Carpentry Slack or through other formats. Hey, thank you, Angela. That was great. And yeah, two plugs. Maintainer lead, check it out. Seems very cool. And there is a session coming up next week, week after, two weeks from now. Um, Bianca's doing a second round of her session on burnout. So check those out. All the links. Does anyone have any questions for Angela while we transition to our last speaker? All right, well, if anything occurs to you, pop it in the chat. Um, otherwise, Esther, go ahead whenever you're ready. Hope you can see my screen. Yep. Great, thanks. Uh, so I am going to talk about the Turing Way, uh, which is a guide to reproducible, ethical, and inclusive data science. 
and if it works, go to the next slide. Great. Uh, so the Turing Way is an open source project uh, that involves many and uh, many members of a very diverse background uh, in terms of skill sets, uh, but also cultural backgrounds. And to ensure that data science is uh, inclusive, accessible, and beneficial for everyone. Uh, so this is a very exciting project. And here you can see uh, the Turing Way. So this is the web page of the book. And the link is uh, in the slide. And uh, hopefully Malvika can actually paste the link in the chat. And so what you see if you go to the, the project's website uh, is the guides that we have for uh, uh, the different components of uh, data science. Thanks for the link. Uh, so there's a guide for reproducible research, uh, for project design, for communication, for collaboration, and ethical research. And uh, yeah, that's too much for the five minutes now. Uh, so I recommend that you have a look yourself. And so how this started uh, was with the book on reproducibility. So it's been massively uh, expanded since then. Um, but the book of reproducibility was really the start of the project. And what we mean with reproducibility is that the same analysis steps uh, on the same data set produce the same answer. And so if you see the image on the slide, uh, that involves uh, going from a research idea uh, to the research data planning and design stage, to then collect data, process your data, uh, analyze the data and getting it published. And to be able to do this in a way that someone else uh, could basically follow all your steps uh, without basically talking to you is quite complicated and can be very overwhelming if you don't know where to start. And so uh, the Turing Way is a way to start. Uh, and the goal of the project uh, is to make reproducible research too easy not to do. So that's a very good goal of the project. And so here you see the repository uh, on GitHub of the project uh, with the link in the slide again. And so it's really a community uh, project. So you're very welcome to join and you can see the code of conduct and the contributing uh, guidelines uh, in the repository. And there, it's not just a repository, but it's, it's really a community uh, that's keeping it alive. And so here you see some pictures of how the community comes together in uh, online collaboration cafes, which are taking place twice a month, and co-working calls, which uh, used to take place uh, every working day, but now we have a summer break. And uh, so this is a very good way to get in touch with uh, members of the project and get started with uh, contributing if you would like to. Uh, I find it a very nice way to keep in touch with uh, everyone and also to just get some help whenever you're stuck on something. So it's really good uh, to have an easy way to reach out to people. And uh, there's a picture of uh, um, a live event, so to say, from earlier this year from the Book Dash. And there we all got together uh, to contribute to the project uh, in one day. And so that was an amazing day. Uh, I highly recommend you going if uh, when, whenever we have these events live again. Uh, it was really great to be a part of all of that. And so I am one of the contributors of the Turing Way, and we have a lot of them. Uh, so 175, uh, if I understood correctly from uh, our latest GitHub issue. And um, yeah, you're very welcome to join. And we seek out contributions. Uh, so it, it varies a lot uh, from what you can contribute. Uh, so you can please uh, have a look at the book and add your contributing guidelines guidelines, and get in touch. And so Kirsty Whitaker is the project lead and Malvika Sharon is our community manager. And she's also on the call if you have some questions. And there's some links and resources where, which you can uh, use to get in touch. So there's also a newsletter. Uh, so if you uh, don't want to contribute, but you want to stay in touch or get some updates, uh, do sign up for the newsletter. And uh, I also highly recommend you to join our Slack channel because uh, you'll get a welcome by a very friendly greeting bot, very friendly. And um, also a shout out to the images of this uh, presentation, uh, artwork by Scriberia. I find it super useful in uh, presentations. It's really beautiful. Uh, so that's also a way to use this project. And with that, I think I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. 
Thanks, Esther. All right. Um, are there questions for Esther and Melvika about the Turing Way? This is Carrie. Um, can you all hear me? Yep, okay. Yes. I popped it in the chat, but I just wanted to, to voice it as well. I feel like there can be uh, so many ways that, you know, the Turing Way community and the Carpentries community could collaborate. I'm wondering, especially from Malvika, as she's ingrained in both communities now, are there low hanging fruit opportunities that we could, um, that would make sense for us to support one another. And I'm also wondering about some, about the lessons, about the book in general, and whether there are lessons that would be good for the Carpentries Incubator. Um, I, I am really glad that you already said the disclaimer that I'm really integrated in both the communities. Um, and one of the reasons I, I'm working in the Turing way is because of my strong association with the Carpentries as well. We are thinking about a lot of lessons in the incubator. And uh, one of the things that is in the plan in next month is a Jupiter book uh, on which the Turing way is actually built. And Jupiter book is itself uh, another tool that, that is open source software uh, that we want to build inside incubator. but. But there's so much. I totally agree on that because we do have the equal alignment on inclusive community building. We also have inclination towards how to make it more collaborative from, from members who are, for example, neuro, neurodivergent, people with disability, people from extremely different cultural background that is often not considered inside technical books that, that is available at the moment. So, uh, Carrie, I think I should just sit down with you uh, and talk and then open this conversation also to the wider community. All right. Thanks, Malvika. Thanks, everyone. Okay, let's do one final round of virtual applause for all of our speakers. What a great smorgasbord of talks. It was really fun. Um, for those who joined us late, please sign in on the Etherpad. There should also be a link on the Etherpad with a feedback form. Let me see if I can rustle that up real quick. Um, so uh, your feedback would be super valuable to us.